Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Cliff, for the uh, introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about quantum computing uh, this afternoon. Um, my name is Christian Basilla. I'm with Anion Systems. And uh, I'm delighted to uh, have the opportunity to give you a bit more details on a case study that's actually happening right now. We hear a lot about quantum computing. Uh, this is a summit where a lot of people are focused on, on classical infrastructure, high performance computing center. So today we'll talk to you about a quantum computer that's about to get deployed in a high performance computing center and how this could be uh, relevant for you. So the, the overview of the project is as follows. Uh, the, the machine is named the Monarch by the customer. What it is is a 24 qubit superconducting quantum computer. It's designed and fabricated by Anion Systems, and it's going to be owned and operated by an HPC center called Calcul Québec. So Calcul Québec is an HPC center, I'll give you a bit more details, but has been in operation for uh, a few decades, and they already operate two of the world's fastest supercomputers. Super computers. So they will be adding this quantum infrastructure within their existing facilities. One interesting point of, of this project, and we believe that affects quantum, if you look at quantum computing, and Heather mentioned it, is it, it, there's, um, we believe there are many years ahead of us before we reach commercial usefulness. And in these years ahead, funding will be key to advance this technology, and, and a lot of that funding is going to come from governments. Actually, there's a number of studies out there that also explain that today, uh, Western governments have committed over $15 billion to quantum computing to help advance this key technology. Now, some of this will go to fundamental research and academia. Some of it will go to um, case studies and algorithms. Some of it will go to deploying systems like in this uh, specific case study. So if you look uh, to your neighbor to the north in Canada, uh, they, there is a quantum strategy that's been released very recently. And there are three pillars in this strategy that fit into this, this project. So the first pillar is to advance fundamental research and give researchers access to a quantum computer. Well, Calcul Quebec already has 5,000 users from different universities and research centers. So these 5,000 users will be able to log into the same job dispatching uh, software they're used to and to run jobs on a quantum computer or a classical computer or to split it between the two. The, the second angle of the, uh, the Canadian strategy and, and that a lot of countries have in their overall quantum strategy is they're realizing that there's a new talent generation that needs to be developed. People that understand quantum computers, they're going to be able to program and run these machines. So if they don't start today, if you don't start to train them, uh, how are they going to be ready when the technology matures? So with this, this uh, project, basically a lot of people within academia will be able to start to experiment with quantum computers, not just on the algorithmic side, but also at the base level controls of the machine. And uh, the final uh, element of the pillar of the Canadian strategy is commercialization, how to help set up a local ecosystem. And in this case, this project supports the development of Anion Systems. It's the second computer that we will be deploying. One thing that's unique about this project is you probably hear a lot of different companies talk about quantum computers and what they are doing. Um, if you sift through this today, there are very, very few quantum computers that are actually deployed uh, outside in the world. There are a couple of vendors that can actually build quantum computers, have built some. Uh, but in most cases, the vendors host these machines at their facility or may deploy them at, at other facilities which they, co they control and uh, operate. So in this case, the machine is actually being delivered on-prem. This is an on-prem device. It is sold. The end user owns it. The end user is going to administer it. The end user is going to operate the machine. So it's, a, it's probably one of the closest examples to classical HPC infrastructure from a deployment of a quantum computer. Now, I'll take a few seconds to tell you about uh, Anion Systems. Um, we've been around since 2014, which makes us one of the oldest companies uh, in quantum computing. Not the oldest, but uh, definitely one in the, the older peer group. We're based in Montreal. We're privately funded. And one thing that's uh, unique about us is we're vertically integrated. So we believe quantum computing is going to need to scale up substantially over the coming years. And every generation of product that we built is substantially more powerful and larger than the previous one. But if you're going to scale up and you're an integrator of components from different suppliers, there's a chance that these suppliers might not scale up the way you want to scale up or at the pace you're scaling up or with the features or capabilities that you require. So that's why in our early years, we did the hard work of making sure that we could build an integrated product. That means we make our own 
quantum chips. We design and fabricate them. We have our own cryogenics that are designed in-house and fabricated in-house. We have our own quantum control electronics or firmware. So that enables us to build a fully integrated product that we can deliver to customers. So if you look over time how our technology has evolved uh, since our st our, our, we started operations, 2015 was the first year of very active R&D efforts. And at every pace of our development, what we've tried to do as a commercial company is to find a customer for our product or where we are at. Uh, one of our first customers was Google Quantum AI. So in 2016, the first piece of the quantum computer that we had developed is a, a simulation toolkit. So some of you here might be familiar with software companies like Synopsys or Cadence that help design classical chips. Well, we believe you need the same thing in quantum computing. At the time when you're making very few qubits, the experimental approach was approach followed by many individuals. We believe that that was not gonna be able to scale up, so we developed the simulation toolkit and actually uh, helped Google design a couple of generation of chips. And that was a very successful uh, project, which gave us the confidence as a, as a startup or a young company at the time to say, well, let's build our own integrated quantum computer. So in, in 2017, we started what we call our hardware efforts, and we built our first control electronics. We fabricated our first qubits in 2018. We fabricated and had our first uh, dilution refrigerator operational in 2019. And in 2020, we had our first uh, order for a quantum computer, which came from the R&D branch of the Canadian Armed Forces, a division called DRDC. So they, that machine was fabricated and completed at the end of 2021. You can see a picture here. This is a six qubit machine, so the first generation of, of what we fabricated. And in 2022, we had our second order from the High Performance Computing Center I mentioned earlier called Calcul Quebec. And that order was modified during the course of this year, and they've upgraded it to make it a 24 qubit quantum computer. So what you see the picture to the right of the screen is actually a picture of the a render of that computer. And a bit later, I'll show you a picture of the machine because it is currently fully built uh, at our offices going through final acceptance. Now, before I go there, I thought it might be relevant for the, the audience here to, to think about the roadmap. And I know Heather made some, some interesting comments, and you're going to hear about, about different speakers. So I think uh, if you're interested in quantum, thinking about when it becomes useful is a, is a key question to, to ask, and I think a very valid one. So we view this as a, a two-dimensional horse race. You need more qubits, and you need better qubits. So the more qubits, as you can see on the bottom axis, people refer to reaching a million qubits uh, to get a useful quantum computer. But if you keep on building the qubits that are available in the market today that, are, that have a high error rates, you're probably going to need a lot more than a million physical qubits to get a useful machine. So people are trying to make these qubits better, and there's different approaches. There's a lot of fundamental research, a lot of applied uh, research going on that. You can change the architecture of the qubit you've built. You can add a software layer to, to try to error correct the information you get from your qubit. So uh, the goal of today's presentation is not to get into the details of what it is, but hopefully if there's one thing you can take away from the presentation today is you will see a useful quantum computer in an HPC center when it has enough good quality qubits. And at that point in time, hopefully it can compete and exceed what HPC supercomputers can offer to the world. So what we're to, if you look at the yellow dot here, that's a rough estimate of where we view the market being at. And this is from a superconducting lens, which is the architecture we follow. So most machines are below 100 qubits, uh, will be between 10, 20, 30, 50. The higher number of qubit machines probably have a number of inoperational qubits or higher error rates. Uh, you could you get into the details. There's a lot of public information on this that you can get. And you see the error threshold uh, on the other axis. Now going forward, our view as a company and from a technology roadmap, we don't believe in the million dollar, in the million qubit roadmap. We believe that fundamentally a lot more work needs to go on the quality of the qubits to address the error rate rather than building machines that have too many low performing qubits. So let me tell you a little bit more about the customer here, the HPC Center, Calcul Quebec. Um, this is an existing uh, center that already provides uh, academic and research communities with state-of-the-art computing infrastructure and expertise. Obviously, they, they don't run the top five or top 10 uh, machines in the world, but they do have two of the top 500 
supercomputers in the world. Obviously, these rankings change over time, but based on the latest findings, they, were, they had one that was about uh, 108 and the other one 384. What is key for us is they already have 5,000 users of these high-performance computing machines, which means a portion of these users that are interested in learning, testing, and trying quantum will now have access to Monarch and will be able to try, test, and learn on a quantum computer. Um, so if you look at what this looks like, practically speaking, if we think of an HPC center, um, the picture on the left you've seen before, that's a render. That's when we designed the product. The picture in the middle is the unit as built in our offices going through final acceptance. We just didn't put the outer layer yet. And the picture on the right is the physical space where it's going to get deployed. We took that picture about a year ago. Uh, if you go there right now, it is completely full of classical HPC servers. And there is one dedicated space for this quantum computer. Now, one might ask, why would I want a quantum computer on-premise? Why not access it through the cloud? Well, there, there's a number of, of uh, benefits to on-premise integration. And our view as a, as a young company in this field is that quantum will end up being on-premise. We believe that today there are a lot of complex problems out there. Many of them are being solved. And a lot of this goes through an existing infrastructure of HPC centers. So a quantum computer um, will bring computing power when it reaches maturity. And it, it, our vision is that computing power will be best served in this existing infrastructure. So uh, network latency is one of the reasons why you want to want to have this on-prem access control. Obviously, some of these problems are extremely high value. Um, you know, data sovereignty, security rights. These are all things that you need to think about if you think about useful quantum computing. Less of an issue today because the machines are earlier stage machines. But as they will address high value problems, these are, are items that we believe are going to become front and center. Let me tell you now a little bit more about who, who are the, the users, who, who can benefit from quantum computing? Why did this end user decide to invest and purchase a quantum computer? And by the way, we're seeing similar approaches in different parts of the world at different levels of maturity. So we do expect in the next few years that you will see more quantum computers being deployed on site, on prem, at different locations in the world. And these computers will serve who? Um, I'm not, I don't want to say this is an exhaustive list, but uh, it's, it gives you some examples of who will be using it. So on the academic side, we believe as quantum is this emerging technology, there will be a very high demand from academia. So people focused on quantum research, uh, people that have very, very large complex data problem sets that, that might not need to be solved today, but they need to find a path when they will be able to address it. So they, they will have the incentive to experiment on this new type of infrastructure, infrastructure to see if it can help them down the line. Uh, you're going to have also um, industry. So uh, we have, we're going to have a few speakers here from industry that are going to talk. To the best of our knowledge today, um, we're not aware of one company that solves its complex operational problems using quantum computers. The goal is obviously for that to happen over time. And I'm not saying they're not experimenting or, or trying with a test case or a, a, a reduced size problem to learn. But the goal always is, when is it going to be useful? When is this going to be a tool that people use to create value? So these industrial users can start to experiment with the technology accessing this, uh, this quantum computer. So this is a quick overview. Um, one question I always ask and people ask me is like, so, so when is this going to happen? I've been hearing about quantum computing for decades. And is it, is it going to happen in two years? And when is it going to impact my life? When am I going to really see this? So, I'm not going to give you my opinion. What we try to do is we try to put what we see as the two sides of the spectrum to some extent. So um, McKinsey, a very credible organization, uh, covers quantum computing, publishes on it. And they have a recent report where they say that they believe that a useful uh, quantum computer could arrive, could arrive as early as in the second half of this decade. So we classify that as the optimists. We think the, this is probably about, uh, amongst the, the, the earliest date that it would happen. And then if you look at the, the other end of the spectrum, uh, uh, DARPA uh, is obviously investing very heavily in quantum computing to understand how it's going to work. They're investing in establishing benchmarking. How do you benchmark the different machines? Uh, how do you reach utility scale? And, and, and here's a statement that uh, we've taken from one of, the, one of their um, publications. And in here, they're saying, we're not sure this is going to happen in less than a few decades. So end of the century, two decades. 
We believe somewhere between there, and again, the, the focus is not when will there be a quantum computer. There are functioning quantum computers today. The question and these, the, 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 the pendulum that we've put here is when will we have a useful quantum computer? One that basically will solve not every problem, but many, not just one, many useful, relevant problems. Um, so, so we think it's going to be somewhere between those two, uh, those two timelines. So in conclusion, uh, quantum computers are starting to get deployed. And you're probably going to hear more about it. This is no longer a, a um, R&D discussion. These machines are being built by different vendors. They are being deployed. And on-prem, we believe, is key. This is going to continue. Why? Well, we've mentioned about the, the committed funding uh, from the government. And we believe industry, as, as Heather pointed out, are going to be spending hopefully more and more every year as they want to test uh, and adopt this uh, technology. And then the holy grail, I think, again, Heather pointed to it, are we going to have a flip of the switch where all of a sudden a useful machine will come? I think that would be the, uh, the dream outcome for everybody in the industry. We think what is more likely is quantum computing will continue on the path it's been for the last, let's say, 10 years, where there are steps that are, that are you know, achieved along the way. And the technology gets better, and you'll make better qubits, and you'll put more qubits, and your software will get better, and eventually you will get to that utility scale level. Thank you very much for your time. We have a few minutes for questions. If anyone wants to pose a question, there's a mic over there. There's a mic over there. There's a microphone over there, or I can come over. <laughs> Let me come over to you. A question for you, sir. On your, at your calcul for Quebec, have you any benchmarks comparing quantum vis-a-vis -vis traditional HPC? Any Sorry. benchmarks? Benchmarking? Yeah. So uh, benchmarking is a, is a great question. And um, if I told you how many people are working on this, how much money is being spent, including by DARPA and, and, and a lot of other people, to the best of our knowledge, people haven't even found a, an objective or a mutually acceptable measure to compare different architectures or different types of quantum computers because the technology is so early stage. So if they haven't reached that milestone, comparing to classical computers, I think, is a step two. So, so I, I think there's a, a couple of years ahead of us before hopefully the industry agrees on one definition to, to how, how do you benchmark different computers from different vendors with different architecture. That would be step one. And then step two is how do you use that definition to compare it to classical infrastructure. So I think it's a critical point. It's a key point. There's a lot of brilliant people working at this. Uh, we have a question over here on the... He was there first. Oh, he was there first? My apologies. Why don't you go ahead first? Hi, my, my name is Paul Barrell, and I'm interested in what you might um, re request from the rest of the classical computing community to help support this kind of endeavor. I mean, what are you missing from uh, classical interfaces? Is there something that we could do to help build, deploy, orchestrate you know, these systems? So that's a great question. Uh, I'll speak again from our architecture, which is the superconducting architecture. And we were discussing this uh, a bit earlier before the sessions. The, the machine we're deploying in this HPC center basically has no incremental requirements. We're, we're using floor space. Uh, we're taking a little bit of uh, chilled water, a little bit of power, but much less than what they need to think about and plan for for their classical infrastructure. Now, the machines, the quantum computers, will get bigger. but the, the way they are designed and they work, I think it's, uh, they, they're expected to consume a lot less power and take a lot less water than classical infrastructure. So, so I believe the existing HPC infrastructure is already ready to accommodate larger and larger quantum computers. Where there will be, I think, need for a lot of work is going to be on the software side. So developing, if you have a complex problem and you want to solve it or test it on a quantum computer, you can't just copy paste it to the, the other system. So you will need people that know how to develop quantum algorithms. And you don't really care about that as a user. You have a problem, and you want a, an answer to your problem. So I think in training the workforce, that's going to be key. And in this specific example, this HPC center has already hired three or four people. And that's going to be their only job, is basically to talk to the users that have a complex problem and help them translate it so they can test it and run it on the quantum computer. Thank you. you know, we're spending a lot of time at this conference talking about ways to limit uh, the thermal output of computers, you know, in terms of watts per k 
calculation. How does quantum fit in that frame? Uh, is it going to do more computations with less power, same power, or maybe a little bit more, but so much faster for the computations? So, um, very good question. The short answer is uh, quantum is expected to deliver substantially more output with significantly less input. So, so uh, and there's, there's publications I'd be happy to share with you, not done by us, but on the expected power requirement per um, calculation output you're going to get. Now, that is all based at when the technology reaches its usefulness or its maturity level, which we've given you a pendulum where it is. We don't think it's in the next couple of years. But, so, but there are some studies on, on water consumption and electricity consumption for similar type of power when it gets to maturity, and it's a fraction of what classical infrastructure takes. So all those 10 and 20 megawatt data centers may not be needed after quantum becomes a factor. Or, or, or you, you may not need to build as many new ones or to increase the power that's required in each one. Now, and, and we're going a bit sideways, but our, our view is the classical infrastructure will always continue and will always be required. I think we think quantum is an accelerator to that. A portion of the problems, some of the problems, are going to be able to be solved a lot more efficiently on quantum computers, but you will need the classical infrastructure. But everything you, if, if the, those predictions come through, everything you push to the quantum infrastructure makes the overall data center much more efficient from a data consumption, a power consumption perspective. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. On one of the slides which you showed your milestone, there's a, a a dilution refrigerator. Does the, does the deployed one requires that kind of low temperature? So, so yes, the dilution refrigerator, uh, it basically what it does is it, it brings the, the, the temperature of where the, the qubits are operating somewhere around 15 to 30 milli K. So, oh, so okay. very, very cold. Now, Dilution refrigerators are not novel technologies. They've been installed and deployed in, in mainly universities, physics labs for, for decades. Yes. Yeah. So that's my next question. If you want uh, your, uh, your quantum computer to be used at the industrial level, where can you find that much helium-3? That much? Helium-3. Helium Dilution refrigerator use helium-3, right? Yeah, uh, very good question. Um, we don't think there's going to be that, uh, such a huge quantity of helium-3 required. So if you look, for example, at the machine that we're delivering, uh, that's our generation two cryogenic system. That can support uh, over 100 qubits easily. Our gener generation three is designed already, and that one can go into 1,000. So I talked about the generation leaps over time. So uh, the chip in the, in the system is actually not large. And, and this ties to the point I mentioned earlier. If your target is to put more qubits that have high error rates and you need to get to a million qubit system, you can look and, and Google published a, a render of what they envisioned as a possible one million qubit system. The, the amount of helium-3 you will need in there is gonna be astronomical. We believe you need to go to the, the, the base elements and, and find a way to make better qubits so that you don't need a million qubits and that's gonna impact the size of your cryogenic system, the number of wires that go down your uh, cryogenic system and uh, the quantity of helium-3 that's required. Uh, you, you talked about having a dedicated quantum workforce to help users, um, right? You said people who actually know how to write quantum algorithms. Um, I'm curious if you have a view on like that workforce question more broadly. If we are thinking about building out this ecosystem, right, in the same way as like, well, the hardware aren't substitutes, is the labor substitutes? Do we just take like existing developers or existing hardware engineers and teach them what a gate is? Or do you have to go and find somebody totally new? What's, what, what are your views on the kind of workforce development for the quantum environment? So, so it, it's a great question. I, I think the 
early generation, the, the first users will need to be highly technical, highly trained, probably have a background in physics and computer science. So it's going to be, it's going to take time. And, and, but hopefully as the technology matures, the tools get better, you can, you can make it easier. The, the analogy we like to use is, you know, the, you had the first generation of people that could program in DOS, right? And not a lot of people knew how to write all these commands by memory. And there wasn't a lot of documentation. And eventually you had C sharp that came around. And, and today people are using rendering engine like Unity to Unreal, which is even easier and quicker. So, so the software gets better, gets more user friendly, and I think that reduces the, um, the threshold of, of the skill set the, the, the software developer needs to have to become proficient in this field. But, but we expect for the first five to 10 years of use, the threshold is probably going to be quite high and, and require people that understand the basics of physics and of, of programming. And can you speak to the hardware side of like, right? Uh, do do I don't know anything about superconducting? Is that is that a game breaker? Well, I, I don't think you need to. So uh, on the hardware side, like I think you, and again, it's gonna. It's going to get better over time. Earlier on, what, what we believe is the manufacturers that, that develop these devices are going to have to work in partnership with the users and, and help train them too. So if you're working with someone um, that might not be an expert in quantum computer and doesn't have 10 years of hardware development experience, that's OK. But they'll, they'll still need to understand the, the basics of, of qubit architectures and how to run a circuits and, and, and the different things that, that will help them create an algorithm. And I think this is where the manufacturer collaborates with the, the end user. OK, last question, because we have to move on, but it's yeah. been good. <laughs> I'm a chip guy more than a system guy. And so I'm just wondering, are there any new semiconductor net technologies that are going to be needed to make the chips that go into this quantum computer uh, and or to man chip manufacturers have to get new tools to do that? And, and what kind of process technologies would be comparable to this for this? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, so, so right now, we're fabricating our chips in, in a quantum nanofabrication center. Uh, if you look at the different vendors, uh, some of them have built their own quantum nanofabrication centers. Overall, size is much less relevant uh, than in classical infrastructure. So, so existing tools kind of work quite well. What you cannot have, the, the, the issue is more anything when you have contamination with certain elements in, in, in these uh, nanofabrication centers, they, they become basically useless for producing quantum chips. So either you have a dedicated quantum center where you don't introduce some of these, I'll call them banned materials. Um, but, but we think um, classical infrastructure is already far enough that most of the tools you'll need to make the bigger, bigger chips exist already. OK, thank you. Thank you, Christian. Uh, 